happy to announce the launch of our new logo. We have evolved since our incorporation in 1997 and it is time to refresh our new look to reflect who we are today. Before I reveal our new look, however, walk with me while I take you through our journey of the last 25 years. Trust Bank was incorporated on July 3rd, 1997 and began operations on October 1st, 1997. Following the collapse of the parent company of its predecessor, Meridian, the CBG stepped in and recapitalized the bank and held the shares in trust, thus the name Trust Bank. In 1999, the first investors who responded to the IPO and paid $1.50 per share received their maiden dividend of 50 bututs per share. In 2000, the bank fully paid back its investment by declaring another dividend of $1.20 per share, making it a cumulative dividend per share of $1.70 which was 20 bututs above the purchase price. Between 2002 to date, share capital has increased from $27 million to $200 million, indicating that the bank has grown organically by plowing back profits to increase capital, while at the same time paying dividends to shareholders. The bank was listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange in November 2002, being the first ever cross-border listing in the sub-region. Now let's talk about awards. The bank was awarded the insignia of the National Order of the Republic of the Gambia, ORG, in the year 2010 by His Excellency the President of the Republic of the Gambia. During the past years, the bank has received so many national and international awards. Banker Magazine, six times. Global Finance, six times. Gambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, five times. We began operations with three branches. Now, we have 18 branches and 20 ATMs and counting. On digital services, mobile app, check. Online banking, check. Transaction alerts, check. Watch this space, we've got more coming. Creating employment, yes, we've got that too. 400 and counting. And we take great care of our people too. Medical insurance, life insurance, private and state pensions, annual pilgrimages for both Muslims and Christians, training, yes, we do them all. One team, one family, one goal. That's the Trust Bank spirit. On corporate social responsibility, we have spent over $50 million in various courses. We care, and so we share. Over the years, we have paid over $1.6 billion to our shareholders, which translates to a whopping $20 per share and counting. Phenomenal returns for our shareholders who purchased at $1.50. Corporate taxes, over $1 billion is paid. Our journey started with a vision to create the kind of company that delivers quality services and innovative products with an inspired team dedicated to serving our customers, our environment, and our communities at large in the most caring manner. We remain fully committed to delivering excellent services to each of our stakeholders, customers, employees, shareholders, and partners. So, we remain true to who we have always been. As we look forward to greater achievements, we are rebranding to reflect who we are today and the future that we inspire. Our new logo has been designed to visually demonstrate our Gambian heritage and the sophisticated nature of the bank. We are moving away from the navy and gold-colored parallelogram-shaped logo to our baobab tree with a rising sun in the background. The striking outline of a baobab tree at sunrise is a familiar sight to anyone who has spent time in the Gambia. Our new logo and visual identity are inspired by our core values and spirit of being a pioneer in providing a unique banking experience. It is a completely new look that better matches the transformation we have made as a company. But we remain your trust bank. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to present to you our new logo and corporate identity.
fay lempo waru galla ci kepp ko xamne doomi rew mi nga ak ñu fi dekk bu fekke ne ci at mi sa kom kom wessuna ñaar fuk ak ñenti junay dalasi mbete wer bu nekk di nga am lu tollu ci ñaari junay dalasi lempo ci la nguur gi di sukande ko ngir liggey yokute rew mi jra moy bank has bu nguur gambia sas ngir mu feye ku lepp luy lempo ci biir rew mi be taxna jra di yegal fay kati lempo yi ne waru galla pour ñu fay lu ñu nan withholding tax on contract payment manam bep contract bu way joxe te ci biir rew mi lañu to kon xali ci contract bi ngeen nangoto war nga ci wañi ci xayma témer bu nekk fuka bu fekke ne contract bi dekku ci biir rew mi bu boba di nga wara wañi témer bu nekk fuka ak jurom li moy lempo bu ñu nan withholding tax on contract payment li moy lempo bi nga xamne yow mi joxe contract waru galla nga wol batiku dem fay ko ci makani jiaré tax office bu la gëna jégé mbété ci banque yi jiaré jagléel pour fay lempo war nga djébal lempo bi ci diiri fuki fan ak juroom ganaaw bi nga wañé ci xali ci contract bi amul ben contracto bu ñu téggel fay lempo bi xana mu fekk né nguuri gambia ñoko djégalé bolé ci project yi nga xamné mbotaay ndimbali ñokoy dépense jiaré di fay ku lempo ngir yok For the first time in the history of the Gambia, Gambia Printing Publishing Corporation proudly introduces the Billiomatic Exercise Book Printing Machine. The machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. With the Billomatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non-size restricted printing service supply across the sub-region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. This season on Kerfatu. The reason I have always called for a national dialogue is because a government must be responsive to the needs of its people. Fatsu. Tell me one thing, if I was a me as an individual, if I know that there is somebody that I definitely wrong, yeah. I will be bold enough, I will, the the I will go to the party, I will appeal to him and apologize him. I have to make decisions today, because I don't make decisions lightly. I investigate, I do my research, I get the facts, I call the experts, I, I summon meetings, I get the technicians, then I reflect and I make a decision. Why did you lose the election? Well, we lost the election because of treatment registration. We had evidence of people being registered before the opening of the registration. Hello and welcome to season six. Today is a very exciting day here at Kirfatu. I just saw somebody said the, the, the day of making history in Kirfatu. Yes, it's history. Uh, we're launching uh, season six. Uh, it's safe to say Kirfatu is the fastest growing network ever in this country. In five years, uh, we're able to uh, record over 300 episodes on this show. Uh, in five years, we're able to attract over 300 of you our followers on our Facebook page. In five years, we're able to attract 75,000 followers on YouTube, 70,000 followers on Instagram, almost 25,000 followers on TikTok and on Twitter. This is what we were able to do in five years. And just like Watson Gambia said, um, if there's any platform where you need to clarify or do any of those, this is the network. And today, mm -hmm. that's why we have our guest here. Yeah. He is always here when there's something <laughs> to clarify. Uh, Mayor Ben Suda, welcome to Kirfato. Thank you, Fato. And we're excited to have you as our season premier guest. Uh, not just because of the, um, <coughs> the, the circumstances surrounding, but also your role in society. Of course. As <coughs> I always said, 
a young person who a lot of us admired, who are inspired by you and the work you are doing. But all of that we will be talking later on the show. Thank well, you. Well, welcome once again to the show. Thank you. SI season six. I'm excited. Um, we took a break. We wanted to rest. A lot of things happened. But we are back on season six. Yeah, happy to be back. Um, yeah, I was also <laughs> expecting... Um, I mean, because I, I like remember... like to start the banger, right? Yeah, because I was... I, I remember asking you, who are we having? I yeah. remember when we were, um, you know, doing the promo. You yeah. were telling me somebody. And yeah. I was like, mm, I don't think. Yeah. But anyway, when you, you know, send me this... When I sent you the fly, you were like, We're wow. having Lord Mayo. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I mean, at this point, who else? At this point, yeah, who yeah, else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. At and I think... Point. um. It's good that we have him, not only you know because of the circumstances, the political situation, but also like you said, um, the role that he plays in society. Um, you know, not only as a politician, but also you know somebody who inspires a lot of young people in this country, um, as far as politics and leadership is concerned. So um, I'm expecting a very exciting conversation. Well, tough questions will be asked too. Exciting. <laughs> Uh, controversial and interesting yeah. but nevertheless we will also appreciate uh, people like him I've said it and I've said it openly and I remember during my Facebook post on his birthday I said my favorite favorite mayor and a lot of people saying why I'm like you know when we I remember uh, when Jamek was um, Jame was here and people say oh young leadership we are tired of young leadership and when we have people like him we're like, okay, this is this is refreshing. We mm -hmm. we want people like him. Now, when we see controversies coming around, we'll be interested mm -hmm. to know what is really happening at KMC. Exactly, to cl especially to clarify, to clarify all those things. Mayo, once again, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Vato. Mayo, we, we let's start with at what happened at the audit, national um, at, at the national assembly. Yeah. Um, recently, we have seen councils going to the national assembly committee um, to look at the audit reports and hmm. KMC was there. Hmm. Take us through what happened there. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we went to the Finance Public Accounts Committee, yeah. uh, which was at the National Assembly. And of course, they're reviewing our audited accounts for, in KMC's case, 2020 and 2021. Okay. Uh, the last time we went there as councils, they said they would make a cutoff year of 2019 because pre-2019 bookkeeping was not up to standard and the financial statements were not intact now pre-2019 that is 2018 and below uh, we came into office mid-2018 mm -hmm. so it just shows you that's before this new alumni and it's most of the accounts were generated during the last regime yeah. But it shows the capacity of councils that we took over. Um, most of the issues raised during my time there at the FPAC was bookkeeping issues. Yeah. Um, that accounts were not done properly or um, in the case of, for example, certain invoices or receipts, they were not being accounted for properly, where they were not be traced. Now, that's usually a finance director issue, the accounts department issue. Um, the Audits are also for the benefit of the council Councils, because yeah. we do not run the administration. People like the CEO and the finance director, <coughs> and the accounting officers, and as they transact, it's difficult for us to know unless an audit is done. Yeah. So the audit is not only for the benefit of the parliament, but it's the benefit for the councils and the chairman. However, the major problems, like I said, are all bookkeeping issues. And it's all about capacity. Yeah. If you have a finance director or a team in your accounts department without the right qualifications and the right capacity, that cannot be an issue you can blame on the council. But is that not your issue? You are the head of the... It's not an issue because we don't staff our councils. You don't appoint these people. We don't appoint these people. Another thing is also the pay scale doesn't allow to have a qualified accountant, an ACCA holder. All credit to our finance director because he's done a tremendous job with the level of uh, experience he has and level of qualification he has. But I think he's done better than most finance directors just because there's an institutional memory there. But there's a lot missing still because he's not an ACCA holder. 
and in certain cases the people auditing them are ACCA holders. So until such a time councils are allowed to capacitize their own human resources, to actually hire their own human resources, to actually control their pay skills, we cannot attract the talent we need to effectively run our accounts. So as, as the political head of the institution, you don't appoint the CEOs, you don't appoint no. the finance directors. No. Do you have a say in even the process of their appointments when they are brought to councils? So most council staffs we inherited. Okay. Um, there's a committee called, sorry, there's a commission called the Local Government Service Commission. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, it was decentralized and every council had its own. And the council or the chairman okay. would pick members of society, upstanding citizens of society, and co-opt them into those commissions to do the human resourcing of councils. Now, at some point, the law was uh, uh, sort of uh, taken back uh, and changed and amended. Um, it was the time of like one day, when I guess at the time, the politics was such that uh, they felt that he was getting too powerful or he was getting too influential. And they decided now to claw back those laws and make it a unified local government service commission appointed by the minister. However, there's a key word there, an independent local government service commission. An independent. It should not be controlled or influenced by either the councils or the ministry. They should have their own office with their own secretariat and all councils should have a direct relationship with them. To keep the answer short, no. We do not have a say as to who they employ for councils. However, in the law, it does state in the appointment of a CEO, the mayor or the chairman must be also consulted. Mm. But that's it. That's it. They are just consulted, but you don't have a say as to who can be the CEO or not. So basically, they're doing the entire staffing of council. However, to be fair, they have written to us and said, for grades below grade five, mm -hmm. which is low level staff, such as support staff, such as cleaners, drivers, etc., they can allow councils to do the resourcing. But for anything higher than grade five, which is usually at the management level, level and that's where capacity is required. It's done by central government. It's done by central wow. government. Interesting, Esa. Before I get to the next point, that's a very interesting point. I said this here, unless and until centralized missions, local governments will never work for the people because the CEOs and the finance directors are not appointed by uh, the political heads of the councils. Yeah, um, <coughs> it's good that you made mention of that, decentralization. That was, um, that's the point that I was coming to. Um, we have decentralization. Well, Gambia practices what is called a unitary system as opposed to federal system or government, federal system like countries like the United States of America, Nigeria, among others. However, being a unitary state does not also mean that power should not devolve. For decentralization to work properly, in the case of the Gambia, power must devolve. And that is why um, when the president made that statement um, that he was going to appoint governors and uh, governors in Kem and, and Banjul, my argument was um, in one of the media platforms is that decentralization cannot be a reality in the Gambia if municipalities or councils do not have that modicum of liberty or freedom, you know, autonomy to be able to um, take care of the, their own human resources, like you said, to build their capacities, but also, you know, to control how the affairs of the councils are, um, are being managed. And th this is my argument, because um, the government at some point, the reason why councils don't have that autonomy, which is affecting decentralization in the Gambia, is as a result of, um, you know, politics, partisan politics, in the sense that the executive always sees the council as, you know, because they are closer to the people. In decentralization, local government authorities are closer to the people. Yeah. So they see the council, so local government authorities as having winning political capital most of the times. Oh, Ben Suda launched this, oh, council of socials launched this, and that is attracting them political capital. While the executive, the president, is not giving that credit because everybody is talking about Ben Suda. 
I give a typical example like what is happening currently. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people that you talk to, <coughs> even people that do not belong to the same political party with him, and even um, Rohilo, will tell you that, well, these people are working. And even when it comes to election, we'll vote for them. So this is something that does not sit well with the central government, thinking always that the local government authorities, the mayors and the chairpersons are always getting the credit when we are not having it. And that is why the president, when he said that he was going to appoint these governors so that I mean, because for him, these people that are in office are kind of, um, you know, not helping them. They cannot work with them closely. Therefore, he needed people to represent him there. That is why um, councils find it very difficult. And for me, for decentralization to be a reality, like I said, <coughs> we must have that, um, even though it's not a federal system, we don't have state laws and federal laws. We have uniform laws, which applies to all, you know, regions in the country. But our decentralization must also allow that modicum of autonomy where councils will be able to do certain things on their own. Yeah. But central government always sees this as, um, as a fight between them and the local government. And like, like I've said, <coughs> probably it's only going to happen in the Gambian where you have central government fighting or arguing with local government who build an office complex when you are inaugurating an office complex, make sure you invite us. And that's only in the Gambia. For me, even in a unitary system like the Gambia, Central government has a role, and local government also has a role. Okay. The local government authorities should take development, because they are closer to the people. people. Development should be owned by the local government authorities. They should, they're the ones who take care of that. Building schools, building hospitals, inaugurating, um, laying the foundation stone of, um, you know, solar, solar, whatever you call it. These are things that can be done by the local government authorities. Central government concentrates on key areas. Three key areas. One, you take care of security, internal and defense, external. You take care of the economy and you take care of foreign policy. This is what central government should focus more on. All the issues like that is uh, not, the development That is issues. not possible here. No, um, yeah, in, that's in our own context, central government wants to take ownership yeah, because, because it's also about because, politics. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Is because for them, they're also looking at it from that. But that is why it is dangerous when you have a government... Um, people that do not understand how government is run. Because, you know, at the end of the day, what is important here is how best can development be filtered down to, the, to people. the people. And the central government is not closer to the people. It is the local You're government. You're far away. The local government is closer to the people. Therefore, allow them to take care of that. But central government will always wants to come into competition yeah. with the local government who provides this, we did this, we did that, which is very unfortunate. And as a result, it's not giving the, um, the councils the opportunity, like you said, to manage their own human resource, to capacitize them so that they'll be able to. Because if they had that opportunity, probably, he's talking about finance director, they would have got somebody who really has the qualification and the expertise and all that to be able to prevent some of these things that they have been creating um, before the FPAC, FPAC um, committee. Commission. Now, let's go back to the FPAC. Uh, one thing that also came up was the, um, the metrics that KMC uses. I mean, I remember we wrote that story, but even the auditors alerted us because they were concerned yeah. that uh, how we reported it. Um, it was not uh, that KMC had issues with the money that was raised. There. That, that was the revenue, um, about 80 million revenue. Mm. It was more about um, them not able to access the system that you guys were using to ascertain if actually the money that you are reporting is actually that was what was um, collected. Now, why is KMC systems not uh, traceable by the auditors? Because this can be issues, this can bring issues for you guys in the long run, because people, people can look at it as maybe they're trying to do some corrupt issues <laughs> in the system. That's why they don't have systems that are very uh, audit friendly. So uh, the system KMC uses is a Phoenix uh, system. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a system we found there. Uh, it's not something we created. Um, they said they could not access it because the way the Phoenix system works yeah. is at the end of the fiscal year, the financial year, it doesn't allow users to access and tamper. It only allows you to print reports. Yeah. You can only print reports, cash mm -hmm. flow statements, you can balance sheet, etc. But it doesn't allow you to go into the system to look at specific transactions. Mm -hmm. I think it's designed that way. So. Uh, at the end of the fiscal year, you cannot tamper 
with the financial uh, 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 dealings of the council or the transactions. Yeah. Now, government approached us and said they want all councils to go on the IFMIS. Yeah. And because they want to now centralize how government uh, accounts are run. And they want us to all run on the same system. Mm -hmm. In that way, they can audit us properly. They can also confirm our financial statements. And according to them, that was a basis where they could actually pay subventions on. However, that is the ball is in their court in that area as to the implementation. Because I think the process has been going on for two years or so, but it's still not complete. So councils still are using their own uh, softwares on how to account for their uh, stuff. But it's not that money is missing or there's anything wrong. It's just that they're saying... As the National Audit Office, they could not access yeah. the transactions yeah. to confirm in their audit. So that was that was what was, that was. What was said. Now let's look at um, KMC as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time we we, we 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 had this conversation, we talked about some of the things that you were able to do. Sure. And you promised to come back and tell us at the end of your term yeah. what as as the mayor of KMC, what you were able to do. Mm. Now, as a resident of KM, yeah. I think the biggest achievement I, I feel as a resident is the mapping system yeah. and the ballot. Yeah. Um, in this office, um, this office is in West, West Coast. Yeah. We pay over $400 mm. every month mm. or every transaction that our garbage is collected. Sure. But on my residence, I pay ten dollars, twenty-five dollars to collect my. Uh, I called you several times myself to compliment that because that is what, um, as residents, that's what we feel. You bringing the the box, the, the big uh, drums in yeah. our houses, mm. but also collecting our ballot for five dollars, ten dollars. Yeah. That is directly affecting my income, mm -hmm. and that is as a resident. That is one thing I feel like. Apart from that. Mm. Other things, yes, but that is directly something that uh, benefits that me. Tangible ones. Yeah, this this is something that you feel like, Jakes, I'm 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 saving so much money. Absolutely. Tell us, as a council, together with your councils, what have you been able to do? Why we should choose you over every other candidate? So I, I think that's a very valid question, and that's this is the time to answer those types of questions yeah. since we're heading back for elections. Yeah. Now we have done a lot. But our main priority was waste management. When we came in 2017, if you remember, the municipality was a mess. Yeah. It was a health crisis. There was waste everywhere. There was KMC as an institution only had one or two tractors mm -hmm. to collect the entire waste and two trucks that were broken down. These were open trucks. The council before we arrived had engaged in a transaction to purchase several waste collection vehicles to the tune of $15 million with a company that we even ended up in court with. When we came, the said trucks, which were supposed to be 10 with two street sweepers, I believe, were never functional. They had purchased it as second-hand vehicles, but never worked a day. They were painted blue to look new, so it was a transaction we believed had uh, some uh, uh, dubious activity. And so we started investigating. That was one of the first things we did in office. Mm -hmm. And actually, we ended up in court with the vendor. Still, the case has not gone anywhere. Yeah. But just to show you, we did not find any capacity to deal with the waste management crisis in KMC. If you also remember, the community of Barkwater yeah. barricaded yeah. the dump site because of the poor management mm -hmm. that was happening in there. And waste was eventually dumped at the former mayor's office. Yeah. So waste management was by far the biggest problem facing the council. council yeah. Still, it is an issue, but it's way down the list. Mm -hmm. So we had to do something. So we first tried to engage government through the Jane Commission to get some tractors mm -hmm. from the assets seized from uh, Jamme, mm -hmm. the, the former president. Yeah. Uh, we did not get any success and then we were forced to come up with a creative solution. At the time, council's revenue was about 117 million. After you pay staff emoluments, pay for fuel and maintenance and other issues, you're barely left with any money. You're left with something like 10, 12 million to do development projects. So there was no way we could buy any waste collection 
uh, 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 machinery. Mm -hmm. So that's why we engage in a smart PPP. Uh, we engage in a bright idea to bring about the Mbalit project. Yeah. So the Mbalit project, when it came about, as you have rightly said, we thought about first incorporating the cost into property rates. Mm. But we found out that when it came to property rates, compliance by residences was less than 15%. Majority of people are not paying their residential yes, rates. Right. So even if we try to charge people through their residential rates, there is no chance we would ever uh, pay for the project. Mm. Meaning you couldn't purchase the trucks, you couldn't pay for the fuel, you couldn't pay for the running expenses, including salaries, maintenance, etc. Mm -hmm. So we had to do what all other service providers are currently doing in the Gambia, which is pay per use, mm. pay upfront. Yeah. If you now look at Nawek, for example, the utilities company, they've all gone from the billing system to pay, to as, you go. pay as you go. Yeah. You look at telecoms from billing to credit yeah. because it is very difficult to trace uh, uh, customers if there's no addressing system and if uh, uh, there's no infrastructure that we allow you to collect effectively. So I'm sorry for the long explanation, no, but, but I know necessary. a yeah. lot of people do ask, mm -hmm. why do we have to pay for our mbalit upfront when we are already paying property rates? Yeah. Well, newsflash, 90% of you are not paying your property rates. Yeah. If you were, we would have enough money to double or triple the Mbalit project. Because our valuation of property shows us that we can collect up to $300 million in residential rates annually. But even with record revenues in 2022, our residential rates are till still $26 million annually. Wow. Residential are still $26 million annually. When we were coming into office, it was something like $10 million annually. So this is the reason we had to go for this method. So with the backwater dump site, all know we have been trying very hard to get it relocated. It has no business in the heart of the community. But KMC does not have the land, and we do not have the power to issue land, even if we had land resources so we are relying totally on government for them to allocate a land where the greater banjul area councils can utilize as an engineered landfill mm -hmm. i've been on the media for three or four years advocating for this and every time there's a incident at the backwater dump site i use the opportunity. Uh, opportunity to advocate once more to date government is unable to allocate an alternate landfill because now more than ever, we are prepared to transfer the waste to as far as wherever it's needed because we have the capacity, the collection capacity. So that is in their court. But temporarily, what we have done to limit the hazards is to build a fence, perimeter fence, Around it. to contain whatever hazard is in the backwater dump site from the community. We've also engaged in better infrastructure inside. We've built concrete roads through partnerships. Uh, with the SOS and the German government. We have installed solar lighting. We have built sanitary facilities. We are installing a water system. And we have now a fire tender inside the dump site wow. to help put off fires as soon as they arise. So there's a lot of investment being made in there to the tune of 42 million with grant funding. However, the fence is fully financed and fully paid for by taxpayers' funds. So that is uh, the waste management, management area. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of um, uh, youth engagement, youth employment, when we came to the council, we have employed over 300 youths, fresh employees. We have also given over $5 million in support to youth-led activities, from artists to uh, people engaged in dance to people engaged in various activities. We also have a $20 million youth revolving fund that gives loans to youths who are engaged in either um, um, skills or they are uh, engaged in small business. Aside from that, of course, we are uh, building several markets. Yeah. Uh, in our time, we have built about four markets. Did you build a market? Yes, we have Cause, built. Because I just saw something that. So. Your, your, <laughs> your, your competitor, Bakari Bali, said you have never built a market or a school or anything. So tell us, you build a market? 
So we've built four markets. We've <laughs> four built markets. a lending uh Jilifi Tikunda. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jilifi, okay, that's different from Sikap. Yes. Well, it's, I think it's the same. Yeah. They call it an Jilifi on the concrete. Okay, road. okay. Uh, we are currently building Yafa to Njai market. Yes, we were uh, launching Yafa. We are market. building a Koto market. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've expanded Latrikunda market with 100 new shops. That's uh, 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 one we launched last year. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the market they are referring to that they are claiming we did not build is the Latrikunda main market. Yeah. Um, this is a project we contributed 10% funds towards. Okay. Uh, but most council-led for our projects uh, from the time since 1994, as I have been keeping track, are through Gumworks. Mm. Most most council projects, yeah. Gumworks uh, are initiated projects that council may contribute, and sometimes they don't even contribute. But Gumworks, the way it is set up, it is for local development. So councils are naturally on the board of directors, and they lead in the implementation. So, sorry, not to cut you short, uh, but the, I think the Jilifiti Kunda, yeah. that's the one around the river. Yes. The one from Talinding yes. main... Um, that's the one around the river, from yes. The Tomba, yeah, that's, that's Jilifiti Kunda. Yes. Sikap was built by Yanko Bakoli, I guess. That's around the primary school. I, that's the Sikap market. The Jilifiti Kunda, I know that one. Yeah, so the market we're referring to, Yafatu Njai, we are rebuilding. Yeah, Fatu. I think yeah. it's that's, named after his mother. Yeah. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. but one, the Jilifiti Kunda, I know that yes, one is that one we are we are currently uh, uh, rebuilding, yeah. and we've expanded several markets. Uh, Serakunda, we've expanded, refurbished, we built a concrete road in front, which is um, Latkumbalo Road, yeah. um, which is about I think 400 meters. Uh, we also expanded Bakao Market, Latrikunda German Market. We've we've, we've expanded a, a, a portfolio of of markets. Now, what we want to do now is not just to expand markets or refurbish markets. We want to build new markets, but different this time. And we want to do it through a limited liability company. So we can get the capital required to build it to standard and also to capacity. So we've set up a company called Carnifem Municipal Markets, which is planning to build seven markets over the next few years. Yeah. Right. So as far as our market development, that's what is concerned. Now, in terms of um, parks, yeah. KMC is currently constructing seven parks. Uh, if you go to Bakau, you find that that one is uh, uh, well on the way. Yeah. Um, you go to Talending Buffer Zone, that's well on the way. The one we built in partnership with AfriCell is in Traffic Light, that is now fully utilized and working and it's always populated. Yeah. Um, we have a planned uh, mini stadium with them. We're also building a library. Um, the foundation is up, the money is paid for, it should be finished in the next 12 months. It will be the biggest library in the Gambia. Yeah. It will have an innovation hub and a repair cafe. And that is to uh, uh, invite youths who have diverse interest in mechanics, etc. or graphic design. We are also current, we've planted 190,000 trees, uh, or in the process, because I think the latest number I checked was about 63,000. Um, we also we already gave uh, ten thousand bins to households in the municipality yeah. and twenty thousand others on the way. So these are several projects uh, we've engaged in. There's many more, but off the top of my head, yeah, uh, these ones I can think about. Now let's talk about the Mbalit yeah. project. Yeah. It seems like that's the most controversial project so far. Yeah. Of course, um, like I said, it's one of the most effective that we as residents will um, will take adv- are taking advantage of. But it's also very controversial. Yeah. Uh, first, when the trucks were coming, um, you, the, you go, just like any other major business, right? You get um, tax um, support from government, um, and we remember that controversy here during the launching that you you had to pay millions of taxpayers' money to be able to access the vehicles. Now, you promise that uh, before the end of your term, these, mo- uh, these vehicles will pay for themselves. Yeah. And they did pay for themselves. Mm-hmm. At this point, there are so many um, issues coming out. Yeah. Your own CEO accused mm-hmm. you of pocketing $2 million for every truck <laughs> from that project. Yeah. Tell us, um, are we going to see any of those corrupt traces whenever you are commissioned about the, the Mbali project? So it's quite interesting. I think... Um, a lot of people are allergic to progress. When these trucks came, yeah. I think maybe they were so groundbreaking. So many people maybe could not believe it or could not digest 
that the council could pull this off, yeah. that they were inclined to fight it. And this is starting from central government and even our own ministry at the time. Now, if we bring trucks to service the people, that we will pay over time. What's the difference paying it up front with taxpayers' money or paying it over time with taxpayers' money? I don't think there's a difference. But they claim that it was a business and therefore they would not give a tax exemption. Yeah. I think the motive was they did not believe we had the resources to pay for the taxes levied so the project would fail on arrival. And that's the sad part. A country that's environmentally in a mess, where waste is not taken care of at all. Mm. Even if we miss some steps, I think the government should step in to support, to ensure that this is a success. Yeah. But I think it's not that they did not understand that this is a good project. I think they did not like that it was coming from a KMC led by a, a political party they did not like. So from day one, we started obstacles. First, they levied the taxes. Then many people are unaware that they already conducted a special investigation headed by State House into the uh, mechanics of the project and how it came about. Yeah. They could not produce any tangible evidence. They could not produce anything that said that the project had issues. A year later, we had it in political forums, on the radios, etc. It's natural to expect such from political opponents because, of course, when you have something go going, going so good, something so great, they would want to make it, uh, they would want to punch holes in it and find problems with it. Uh, in your issue with the, what the said CEO said, we find it quite interesting mm. because in 2019, when this project was put together, she was not in office. Yeah. She came one year later. And in fact, one year later, she bought a truck of course, through a council direction, which was more expensive than the trucks we originally purchased under the Mbalit project. Under the Mbalit project, the trucks we purchased, I believe, were about 5.1 million or something. But the reserve truck bought under her tenure was 5.6 million. Meaning, if you pocket, if you had pocketed two million, maybe she had pocketed. Well, the, the role of the, <laughs> the, the, role of the chief accounting officer of council <laughs> yeah. is that end of the day they're accountable yeah. for how council monies are spent. Yeah, they will have to they have to scrutinize, and councils are set up in such a way. The chief executive officer is the chairperson of the contracts committee. Mm. So it is the only committee chaired by the chief executive officer. All other committees are chaired by councillors. So one, they have to do their due diligence. Two, they have to get council approval, committee approval, then council approval, then GPPA approval. Did the, did the Mbalit project go through G All GPPA proposed, uh, GPPA approval? Was it approved by the GPPA? So the Mbalit project started with the expression of interest advertised by the contracts committee mm. to all willing and interested parties to express their interest. Yeah. Then it also went through an RFP, Request for Proposal. proposal yeah. Then it went through the contract, Contracts Committee for evaluation and scrutiny. Then the Contracts Committee recommended to the Council, which is the general body. Then it went under scrutiny, I believe, for almost one month over two general councils before their vote, it was put to a vote and the councillors voted. Then it went for GPPA approval, hmm. who would ask for all parties' interests, all proposals to be sent to them, and for you to say why you chose a certain party. So it is one of the most uh, scrutinized projects and went to the most uh, rigorous procurement process. So that's why to date, all they can do is allegations. Nobody can bring out tangible evidence to say this or that. We always say, if you have evidence, there's police departments, there's fraud squad, and I am an opposition figure. I don't think the police would harbor or protect me. If I was part of the government or part of the government's party, one would understand why if they found me wanting, they would sort of screen it. But the mayor is the, the participant who's most dormant. The idea, of course, I generate. Yeah. The concept, I design. But the process is done through committees, councils, and the GPPA. So like I said, this was a project that was investigated. If you remember, the president did not attend 
the inauguration, nor did most ministers. I think no minister attended, no member of government. Because they, they, they said you never invite them to your uh, launching of events. I did. The president personally called you out for not inviting him to the opening of the new office, which was partly funded by GAM, it's GAM Works and KMC, right? Uh, he is the president. All we saw was you inviting your party party leader and roll a red carpet when the president or the minister should have been the one to inaugurate that building. But, 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 Did but, you do that politically? But, Let but, me finish my question. Was that politically motivated? I wanted to just add to say the president did say that this was entirely funded by the Ghana government. Yeah, that that's was right. his statement. Yeah, but I do know. I'm just saying how yeah, it was. Maybe he can clarify okay. that for us as okay. well. Okay. So this project is from the Jame era. Yeah. So it is not a project under the new dispensation. Yeah. It was a mixture of activities and it was an urban development project that touched many councils. Mm -hmm. In the case of KMC, it touched three roads, the expansion of Bundung Maternity Hospital, the um, uh, construction of the town hall that is under contention here, and councils were supposed to provide 10% of the funds. In the case of Banjul, it was their town hall and I think one or two other things. And I think it went as far as Mansa Konko mm -hmm. and Birkama. Yeah. So KMC was supposed to pay 10%. I believe our whole package was $100 million with all these things combined. This project, I believe, was launched in 2015. But it could not take off the ground and councils could not contribute their quarter. So when we came into office, that's when it took off because I pursued it. Mm. I was so we were supposed to pay about nine point something million so the project could start. But when we came into office, the council was in life support. Yeah. They had overdraft, they were in the red. But through, like I said, closing some doors, through rigorous financial management, we were able to come up with the nine million. And KMC was the first council to pay our part of that contribution within the year 2018. The government confirmed that in the press yes. release, yeah. We were the first between 2018. Development is such that no one can claim it. Many projects happening today, including the OIC, is not by this government. But today, they are claiming it. The Farafenya Bridge is not by this government. Today, they are claiming it. The Jabang Highway is not by this government. Today, they are claiming it. And they will start projects and initiate projects that will be claimed by future governments. So development is an ongoing process. So when but I, why didn't you invite well, the government? So I just want to make just this point. When I hear politicians fighting over, mm. I did this, I did that, I launched, I did it's that. It's your responsibility. We don't it's even your responsibility, and it's 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 not you who did it. It's government as an institution that did it. Okay, MC as a as a as a, as a body. Politicians should focus more on policy making a plan, a vision, things like that, but not trying to inaugurate every single building or hut or market. And so I did not want to respond to those claims. When they say I did not invite them, we have an administration. We can produce letters that showed we invited every government body we believe was of concern, including our own ministry. When we started office, I remember, I used to have direct engagement with OP. But then our minister at the time said we should not have any relationship with OP. We should pass everything through our line minister. So if we invite our ministry, that is their duty to extend the invitation to the head of state. As a mayor, I don't have any direct line of communication to the president. I never have. And it was never an issue that was communicated. So we invited my party leader. We invited all party leaders. We invited GDC, and it was represented by MC Cham Jr. We invited APRC. It was represented by Modla Baji. We invited all former mayors. Lai Conte was there. Yankubokoli was there. Keba Jalo was there. So if the ministry decides to snub our invitation, for reasons best known to them. For us, we carry on. We, we are not here to pick and choose. Those who attended all cut the ribbon. If you look at the photo, all those in attendance cut the ribbon. Of course, lawyer Dabo being the most high-profile politician and my party leader would be singled out. 
And what is a red carpet? A red carpet is lit for even birthdays. Yeah, but... There is nothing special about a red carpet. In every event where you are inaugurating something or you are doing an event, red carpets are natural. Even political party meetings, they roll out red carpets. So I don't see what the issue was there. I think the problem is we have certain people in government so invested in dividing people, so invested in creating conflict because that's how they survive. That's how they're relevant. That in any little thing happening in this country, they will make the most of it by trying to pin politicians against each other. But if I was so against the president, I would not have come out in the set setter that just passed yeah. and made all council resources available for their use. Even though I was not officially invited by him, I knew he was coming to my region. You were not invited? Not by, by, by the head of state. But as a, a, he was coming to my region and it was a national exercise and it's my patriotic duty and as a mayor of KMC to deploy full resources to ensure it is a success. If I did not bring my trucks out that day, it would be a total failure. If we did not bring our personnel out that day, it would be a total catastrophe. Because what was even happening with these set setters, like it happened in the past, is that they are not, bring, they are not cleaning the streets. It is household waste for the most part that are collected by our Mbalit project anyway, that people t use the opportunity and take out and bring onto the street. Yeah. If I was so against the government, when the president was coming from his Meet the People tour, I was a lonely UDP supporter in the midst of thousands of NPP supporters waiting to modestly for the president. Yeah. Like, so you no were... issue of invitation, uh, but inside of the government, it means like, the president probably was misinformed or that well the government was never invited and then he also came and misled the public by telling us that we were never invited um to that event because a lot of people will tell you that the president um, is always misinformed he's not up to date on issues happening but anyway i have a question you made mention of something very important and that has to do with um residential um, um how do you call it um rates yeah. like people not paying rates you're saying that i think 15 percent or so Yes. Um, compliance, meaning majority, one can say 85% are uh, not, are not paid. And, and of course, the president himself hinted to these ones that um, people are not paying tax. <laughs> if they are paying tax, development will be provided. So people who claim for development to be provided must always um, make sure they pay tax. But anyway, that's aside. I mean, you made mention of that. Uh, what action is the council taking? What I mean, action, legal action. Um, because every time people will be someone who start with letters that you need to pay reminders, you need to pay your you know, compound rate and all that. And you will always say you have to pay this on or before this date and otherwise whatever, whatever, legal action. And then nothing comes out of this. Sometimes, sometimes you, you, you talk to some people, they'll tell you that for five years or six years or ten years, they can't even remember the last time that they paid their residential um, 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 you know, um, rate. So that is of course bringing financial challenge to the to the council so my question is what is the council doing about that in terms of legal action that's one the other question has to do with well i don't think it's a question it's a just a contribution to say that it's not only um non-compliance on the sides of residents in km but also on the part of the government are they paying i think in line with the local government act they should subvent the councils or local government authorities is it 25 percent are they, paying development, their development their development development are they giving that because many a times, you know, can't, I've, I've, I've listened to some chairpersons who said they're not receiving that. I think when London came here, he said they're not receiving that. I mean, is the government really giving you that 25 percent? If not, then that's another financial challenge that the council is facing. Is this so? Because we need to also, I mean, I think we'll come to this commission issue. Later. Because at some point I was like, if you're talking about, you know, mismanagement or whatever at the council level, in the first place, you don't even have the moral license because you're not even fulfilling your responsibility as a government. In terms of, in line with the local government act, what you're obliged to do, that is by ensuring that you provide 25%. Okay? You're not doing that. And then you're talking about how these councils are... But anyway, we'll come to we'll that. We'll come to that. Yeah. Answer the question. I have even. Yeah, so I, I will start. With, I, I will about? start with the latter mm -hmm. because that's a simpler answer. Yeah. And then the former, I have to expand a bit yeah. to create context. Now, when it comes to 
the government subventions. Like yeah. you said, in the Finance and Audit Act, it says, this is just one of many subventions, but it's the most significant. Yeah. That government must provide 25% of council's development fund. Mm -hmm. The council's development fund should represent 60% of its budget. Yeah. So in the case of KMC, our last financial year, we generated 332 million. That's with grants, mm -hmm. outside grants. Mm -hmm. But the minus grants, we are talking 235 million in di direct taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, outside, uh, if you look at 60% of that, you're looking at north of 150 million as a development fund. 25% yeah. of that, you're looking at 30, 30, million. 30 million that government should subvent us in that year. They have given us 2 million. This 2 million started after a lot of advocacy three years ago. And they said, okay, we'll start giving you each uh, 2 million equally. With a total disregard to what the law actually uh, says. So the simple answer is they are not. One thing, after I leave this interview, I'm sure you will hear them say, but remember the 15 million or 13 million we gave you during COVID. Yeah. So during COVID, there was a rescue package for all government institutions. Yeah. That's not including including the media. Yeah. That is a national disaster. Mm -hmm. That is not a subvention. Yeah. So in KMC's case, they gave us two months worth of salary. And it was something like 12 or 13 million. We used that amount, actually, because we were not actually in financial distress. But we used that amount to also subsidize... Our, our rent at the markets. So we give vendors at the market two or three months free, free of free, no, no rent payment, mm -hmm. to also pass on uh, uh, the, the courtesy, mm -hmm. just because all of Gambia was under distress. So that's the simple answer for that. Now, when it comes to the more problematic issue of property rates, I think Gambia is a country building on top of itself without a foundation. And that is the fundamental problem. Government is not taking the painstaking time to structure our country. And what I mean is, before you can do anything as far as providing services in a country, you need a plan, an urban plan. Yeah. After that, you need to map out your country and create addresses. That is so basic. Some pe many people overlook it, but it's so, it's basic, so basic and it's so important, important yeah. because everything you build is going to be built on top of that. So just like law is important, addresses are important. So today, if government wants to reach you to provide a service for you, they must know who you are, one, where you are, two. Yeah. If a government is supposed to even provide security, they must know where people are. Yeah. Imagine you have to do an arrest or you have to respond to an emergency. So it is very fundamental and it is also fundamental for revenue collection or tax collection. Yeah. It is also fundamental for commerce. So we've been advocating this at the ministry level because it costs a lot of money. Yeah. And no council can effectively pull it off by themselves. About three years back, I tried to engage the business community to do a stakeholders uh, a forum to raise an interest where stakeholders from various walks of life, commerce, government, would come together and see that this is a fundamental issue that we all have to fix if we are to collect the right revenues or to make the, the right business. Mm. So this is what is fundamentally missing for us to even effectively collect rates and to also effectively enforce the collection of rates. Another issue we have today is the last valuation of property rates which is the mandate of the Ministry of Lands and Local Government, and should be done every five years according to the Rates, Valley, Rates Act. The last time it was done is 2005. Yeah. So for 20 years, properties in the country have not been valued. valued. So if you had an empty plot in 2005, yeah. and we're paying $400, yeah. Yeah. and today you have a <laughs> multi-million dollar <-y> mansion, <laughs> and still paying $400, <laughs> Yep. You know, yeah. how the council cannot collect enough to provide uh, 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 services. So that is an issue that needs to be fixed. Another issue that needs to be fixed, devol devolution of powers and bringing councils into the fray as part of yeah. the entire governance of the country. Today, if you sell a leasehold property, 
you get a lawyer, you just go directly to the Ministry of Lands to do the transfer without the council notice. notice. So if the property was in Esa's name and he sold to Fatu, we have no knowledge of that. We try to find Esa. Fatu lives there. There's no way we can get that property. We can get those rates. And lastly also, the sheriff's division is not functional as we would like. When we go to the courts, we get judgment. Yeah. You go to the city division for enforcement. We have one. It's taken almost all my life in council, four or five years. It still cannot be enforced, enforced properly. properly. And of course, the people, of course, are not helping as well. When it comes to complaint about council services, lack of roads, lack of infrastructure, lack of government presence, everybody puts up their hand. But like I'm saying, when it comes time to payment of your dues, because to live in a country and have the right to receive services, you also have to pay, to pay your dues. Your dues. Yep. Nine out of ten are not paying. They are not paying. So if you take away foreign aid from this country, you take away remittances from this country, we are doing. you take away businesses, yeah. the citizenry is not participating financially. So all the revenues I am naming for you, 90% is paid by business and industry. You also raised something yesterday at the National Assembly, mm -hmm. um, the tourism development area taxes. Um, you expressed concern about you being not be able to properly collect those rates as well, because whenever you approach these businesses, most of them will claim because they are paying to central GRA, they are not able to pay to KMC. So how would that help um, increase uh, KMC's revenue? So government's hunger for revenue over the last two decades or so has caused them to look for new areas to get revenue. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they chose also areas that are the right of councils. So when they created the Tourism Board Act, mm -hmm. they literally said every business within the TDA should no longer pay to councils but should pay to the uh, Gambia Tourism Board. And that's thousands of businesses, especially in the case of KMC, which has the biggest, I believe, tourism sector. Yeah. So we can collect rates, but mm -hmm. we cannot collect licenses. So that's a big blow. Now, the funny part is our law is still not amended to say that we cannot. But when you approach these businesses, sometimes you even end up in court. But they have effectively muscled us out. Another issue we have is Gilma livestock. When they created Gilma, now livestock is paid to that agency. NRA collects billboards. Billboards, yeah which is a council collection everywhere in the world. So effectively, if in the case of West Coast region, geology collects uh, mining. Yeah. So councils are effectively left with three areas, which is licenses, yeah. rates, yes. and market duties. Yeah. So our revenues are very limited. But when we go to other parts of the world, I went to Madison and I looked at, I stayed in a hotel, I looked at the receipt. There was a municipal tax on the room rate. When you look at the utilities bill, there's a municipal tax on the utilities. And like you rightly said, the reason local government needs all these revenues is because they're expected to provide so many services, so many vital services and life support services, from housing to social security to schools to hospitals, all the basics that government can do because they are looking at things at a macro level, yeah. at a national level. Us, we are the local guys to know what people need and try to fill those gaps. But it's not happening here because the revenues are just not there. Can you believe council revenue combined countrywide is not more than five hundred million dollars? It's like two percent of our entire You made mention of something. Yeah. Um three hundred new staff being employed um, since you came. Um, one of the issues that has been raised, well, well, still with yesterday commission issue, but one of the issues that have been raised is um, they want to know whether the councils are overstaffed, and if they're overstaffed, how these people were being hired, whether yeah. due process was followed. Yeah. Out of these 300 people, all these people that you hired, was due process followed to ensure 
that they're employed in the right way, that if these people come and, you know, do their findings, they wouldn't, um, you wouldn't have anything in your cupboard to say that, well, we got this wrong. So, we were inspected by the ministry during the last debacle, the last time I was here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in their inspection report, this was one of the issues they looked at. Mm -hmm. And in their report, in their finding, they said there was eight council staff, eight, yeah. that were not hired in the correct way meaning they needed local government service commission consultation mm -hmm. and they believe that should be corrected and this is the reason you get inspected quarterly yeah by the ministry so that when they find anomalies or when they when they find there's a breach in regulation or protocol that these things are corrected and we also want this because this makes sure yeah. that we are following the procedures mm -hmm. so like i said most of these staff are below the grade five which was allowed uh, to the councils. But these are the things that should be regulated, meaning during those quarterly inspections, during the select committee reviews, to ensure that all councils are complying with regulations. Yeah. But as we speak, the Local Government Service Commission should, has not created regulations. In terms of? In terms of hiring, firing, disciplinary, uh, all those things because that is actually their most fundamental activity yeah. is as the commission is set up the first task they should embark on is to set up regulations and then they should send it to all councils so councils can follow those regulations so what happened to those eight staff in their case well I, 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 I did not follow because remember the inspector's report the only reason it came to surface was because of a court case yeah but it was not a report that the ministry took and said, okay, now that we have these findings, implement we are going back to the council to implement. They never did. They never did. You saw it truly from the inspector. Okay. And that is their role to ensure that they go back to the councils and okay. ensure these things are, are, are corrected. It's not a fight. It is not an issue where, oh, I caught you. No, it's an issue of regulation and ensuring there's compliance and this is why we have gppa this is why we have when you do your audit or you do your findings it's for cost correction to improve the institution to ensure that there's checks and balances yeah because it's the institutions are not an individual it's not a private entity it's a public entity yeah. and what gambia needs is strong institutions for sustainability but i can tell you that central government is looking for that to say oh we caught you you say this is not about we caught you but that's how central government is seeing this, seeing this. we yeah. caught you or oh, we caught you here that's how they they they, they, they uh, see well, when you say caught you caught who no, i mean caught you we cut you like the council we, yeah i mean <laughs> or mayor ben Suda. Oh, well, councils. councils, local government authorities, could okay. be Mayor Ben Suda, it could be anybody the else. CEOs. But so, I'm, I'm saying that this is being seen as a fight on their side. It might not be seen yeah. as a fight on your side, but this yeah. is being seen as a fight because we all know. So these I mean, are, what, these what are normal uh, uh, processes. I mean, look at the mess happening in central government at all levels. I don't think they have the moral high ground to tell councils, we caught you. And I don't think that should even be the mission. Yeah. The mission should be how do to we improve these together. institutions? Yeah. How do we ensure there's more compliance? Yeah. So the mission should be at all levels. There's nobody to catch. I can assure you of that. Now, let's, when you came here the last time, we talked about the CEO. Um, there was issues with the CEO. It ended up you trying to fight corruption and you ended up being corruption fought me and the corruption <laughs> came back after you um you know inspectors were deployed mm. to kmc yeah. uh, a report that never came out we had the report and i think a lot of gambians saw it also going around um the allegations that were leveled against the ceo according to inspectors she confirmed them um that she took thirty thousand from from the said contractor where she said um, it was one Bakari Sani, one of the guys who told him uh, Teranga, like, exact words from the, from the inspector report, Teranga, la Teranga, Kenduko Delo. She confirmed that. Also, one of the things you label against the council was uh, against was uh, the valid price of the plot, which was valued at four point something and seven point something, and council ended up paying 12 million. Also, using council without authority from the council, um, using council property to guarantee a loan that was not approved by the general council body. 
all of these things were what when we discussed the last time you raised here, inspectors, government inspectors came, they inspected, and these were exactly what they found. We can confirm because we saw the report. The investigative report by government was never out. I don't know why, but this was what happened. Did you receive the report from the inspectors when, when after their inspection? No, so we got the report through the court. Okay. Um, like you said, I tried to fight corruption, and corruption fought me. Yes. Um, and I think it's quite discouraging because it discourages people in the future to report such activities. Yeah. It's like, oh, why go through the headache? I'm trying to improve the country. It's not my money. I'm, it's a public. It's public money. Why should I bother? And then it becomes a code of silence. And this is the beginning of destruction of nations. And we know one of the reasons Gambia is very difficult to progress as a country is because first of all we have very limited resources collecting very limited taxes as we just spoke yeah. and those taxes half of them or I don't know what figure but a, a big chunk is not going in the right direction it's not coming back to the people in the form of services and infrastructure and this is why we should actually encourage reporting such issues because the more we stay silent on it the more rampant it gets the more percentage that leaves. That's why today 90% of development projects are either through grants or some sort of long-term loan that yeah. never gets paid. We cannot generate our own money to pay for our own uh, quality of life. So basically to come back to the issue, mm -hmm. I tried to fight corruption and corruption fought me in the most vicious way. Yeah. And I don't think the government was interested in fighting corruption. I think they saw an opportunity to fight me. Why would government fight you? One, I'm not from the same party. Okay. Two, I think I've been too aggressive in my ambition to develop KMC. And they feel that I've stepped on their toes. They feel that I have not asked for their permission, which I don't think I should because I'm an elected officer. They want that thing of... So I think all of these things rattled a lot of them. But I think predominantly I'm not from the same party and my success in their eyes is not their success. But I think it's their success because whatever is the Gambians people's success is all of our success. Yeah, especially the president. And it's good to have a competitive political space because when we outdo each other, who benefits? The people. The people. But if everything has to happen through one party or through one government department, there's no competition uh, to, in development, there's no competition in ideas. And that's how our con 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 country goes back. So basically, I think that was it. Everything you said is to the point. I don't need to repeat it. Yeah. The findings we reported is the findings their own investigation Found, teams reported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think they were expecting to find me or the council wanting and that disappointed disappointment is the reason they suppressed the report and they pushed directly for a commission of inquiry or an attempt for a public embarrassment well one one section um a video making rounds one of your i don't know whether it's a staff um yeah. but you it's know he Mr. was talking very party. confidently mm -hmm. And it still is about these corruption issues. He said he may not have anything against you personally, yeah. but that you are harboring criminals. In his words, criminals. criminals. And criminals are assume corrupt people. Um, so he said both you and the CEO um, are harboring criminals at KMC, and these are you know corrupt you know individuals. Is this the case um, that really, really you know that corruption is happening at KMC, but you're not doing much? Um, to address it. So I don't think I want to comment uh, on, on that video. Uh, I think um, for one, Kemo is like a young brother to me. Secondly, I think if any government detects corruption or detects criminal activity, you go to the nearest police station and report it. He said yeah. he raised the matter with the finance, the finance no, department. No, but I mean, uh, every citizen has a right to go to a police station and say, this is the corruption I have found, and I think it should be investigated. So we are in that season now. 
and this is what I want to make to the yeah. citizenship. Yeah. We are in the season of politics. Every disgruntled person, every person who doesn't like you, every person who sees an opportunity to be famous or whatnot, this is the time they will come out. So we expect this. Even everything that is happening at SKMC is not a surprise, it's expected. The game is on, and I, with politics, there's no rules. So basically, there's a lot being said, not just by him, but by many people. But I always ask myself, with so much evidence in people's hands, yeah. nobody's going to the police. Nobody's going to fraud squad. I media. think that is the first channel. And this is why we want to encourage the government. The anti-corruption bill should be passed. An anti-corruption agency should be set. You don't need commissions of inquiry. You don't need public forums to ridicule people. You don't need people insulting each other on radio. If you have evidence, take it to the police. Let the AG chambers look at that evidence. Prosecute. Yeah. Let us be answering to court. And not on the radios. And not on interviews. And not on there. So I think that is the right thing. And if that was being done on a consistent basis, on a periodic basis, if even there was a commission of inquiry, nobody would term it as a witch hunt. Because we know all cases of corruption are being prosecuted and, and, and challenged. Yeah. But in five, six years, there's been nothing. Yeah. Except now, when we are entering elections, there's a commission. We love commissions. I am so scrutinized over my last five years, both by the public and by the government. And it has only made us better, only made us more careful, only made us more strong. If there was no, nobody putting pressure on us for us to do the right thing, we may lose, uh, we may go the wrong way. So commission of inquiry, uh, public scrutiny is very important to salvage uh, a democracy, it's very important to keep accountability. I think many people have the misconception that we don't want to be commissioned. I actually want to be commissioned. All we are saying is, why not after elections? Yeah. We are going for elections. We are going rigorous campaign. Our competitors are going house to house, speaking to the people. And then we are focused on answering in commissions, trying to say definitely, definitely. If there's evidence, like they claim, take it to the AG's chambers, prosecute, let us answer to court. Now, before we go back to the commission, I still want to go to the CEO this morning. Um, Two years, you've been, there were court orders, there were other issues, and there's still an ongoing case going regarding the CEO. Um, and um, she has not been coming to the office with the other, the other people. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, we saw a, an audio from her where she was begging, actually, government to bring her back to work. And government actually did that. On, on a public holiday, the Ministry of Local Governments issued a statement which was actually very funny to so many people. Um, that looked how that that only showed how serious this issue was to them. Issued a press statement on a, on, on a Monday, a public holiday, to say the CEO was coming to work, and if anybody obstruct her coming to work, uh, the full force of the law will will take course. And she came to work, but she did not have access to to her office. Today, the police came and escorted her and broke into an office to get her access. I want us to watch that video first, and when we come back, we'll look at that. I saw a post from your, you where you said, dictatorship is loading in Gambia. That is serious. 22 years, Gambians never want to, back, want to go back to that era. Even hearing that word, I think a lot of people get <coughs> scared. Now, coming from <coughs> somebody like you, uh, yes, I've always said, Talib is an opposition. But you are one person who is more look like somebody who doesn't politicize things. Yep. You know, you are one person we see move with all political spectrum. When you have events, you see all political divide in that. At some point, you even invited and used other political party members as advisors. Even when some members of your party had to, you know, go wild about that. But you are one person who does that. For you to say this is dictatorship, that says a lot. So let's watch that video. When we come back, we'll look at that and what that means for our democracy uh, when central government and, and local governments can fight to this level. That is serious. Let's watch that video and when we come back, we'll talk about that. This is a 
Young, honey, it's a public like, even, even if the public wants to come, they have the right to be here. Yeah. Yeah. It's a town hall. It's a public This is why we are not stopping building. anyone from entering the Kalaka Hotel. Stop. Now I don't go in, 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 uh, we have a right to stop anyone. Huh? We could have stopped them from coming here. But exactly. we don't have the box. Well, yeah, you don't have the box to stop anyone from coming here. This is a public office. Do what you have to do. We will not obstruct you. This is, you know, you have a duty to do, we have a duty to represent the people that have brought us here. The Ministry of Local Government and Lands, in a later on Monday, authorized the Carnifing Municipal Council CEO, Senabu Martin Sanko, to resume work, warning that any attempts to obstruct Mrs. Sanko and other persons authorized in any form or manner from gaining access to their offices will face full force of the law. Senabu Martin Sanko and her colleagues went to work on Monday as authorized by the Ministry of Local Government and Lands. The CEO and her colleagues were allowed entry into the premises of the council but could not access any office. On a Thursday morning, the CEO returned to the council accompanied by an official said to be from the Ministry of Local Government and Lands and security officers. After meeting with the Deputy CEO of the Carnifing Municipal Council and the Lord Mayor Talib Ahmed Ben Souda to get them to hand over the CEO's office keys was unsuccessful. An office was later forcefully opened by a carpenter brought in by the local government authorities. The youth councillor witnessed the forceful opening of the office. We came here early morning and then uh, they came with her. Uh, I think I counted around 10 to 11 security forces, plain clothes officers who came with her um, to escort her into the council. But from, from the beginning we have all, 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 always said that KMC is a public office, KMC is a public institution. We cannot stop people from coming into this office. But what we cannot also accept is that our subordinates, our staff, to, de to determine and to impose on us which office they would use. When, when the court order came that Sena Martin should be allowed into the council, yes, we have allowed her on numerous occasions. Um, this is her fifth or, or sixth time coming into the council, and on no occasion was she stopped. I think the, the, the only time that she was stopped was the first time when she came with parliamentary officers, and our security forces also didn't allow them to come in. Apart from that, she would come to the council, she would meet the mayor, she would meet the deputy CEO, she would meet the deputy mayor and meet councillors, and then we'll tell her that she needs to go home and wait until the, the, the report of the investigation is out, and then the general council will determine what happens next. Considering the fact that she was put on uh, temporal uh, uh, um, leave or te temporal suspension by the general council and not the decision of any individual. The KMC youth councillor said when they were moving into their new office premises, there was no office allocated for the CEO, which he says was the reason she was allocated a different place. When they said we should open the door, we told them no, we cannot. Because one, that is not an allocated office. We were using it for storage. We were keeping things there. Because when we were coming from our old office into the new building, she was not here with us. So no office was, was, was dedicated for Sinabu Martin Sonko. So if you come to the council and we tell you, use the conference room for now, until we determine what happens, I think that was a very reasonable take. We didn't stop her from coming. In fact, we had even allocated a space for her. But who is she to determine and to tell the council that, no, I don't want the space you have allocated for me. I have to get into this office. I think to see that people are supporting that move, people that were, came here and said that they are here for good governance and transparency are going again and are being contradictory and being ironic in their actions speaks volumes. I think Gambians need to understand that there, nothing has really changed in this country. Today maybe the only thing is that we are not being arrested and this is our constitutional right to speak our minds but the, 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 the institutional memories are still here, the, the, the impunity in the institutions and the structures we have in governance are still very paramount. And this is what we have seen, they finally broke the door to get her in but there was no furniture because this is all we had always told them that this is not an office. We are not even using it. So if she wants to go and lay a mat there and sleep, that's her business. But we will also now sit as a council and determine what we are going to do next. Because people cannot elect us and bring us into this council and you sit anywhere to determine what happens. Is if 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 this is it, it should be tick for tat and we are not afraid of that. And, and, and we are ready to face any consequences that comes with it. He also explains their interaction with the official who accompanied the CEO to the council. We, we, we had responded. The, the place of the key is not for us councillors to determine. It's an administrative issue. We do not allocate offices. The ad administration with the establishment committee at, uh, um, 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 determines where every, every staff should be. 
So they, they had asked the WCO and, and, and he told them that at that moment he couldn't produce the key because he was not prepared for it. So they had told us to change the lock. We called our maintenance guy. He said he couldn't do it today, but let them give him some time and he will produce a new lock. They, they couldn't wait for that. They were impatient because they had orders to follow from higher echelons and they did what they had to do. But this also shows that people would forcefully do what they want to do in, in this country because they have power. And it just determines that uh, people need to wake up and realize that if we don't stand and fight for our rights, we will be sliding back to where we used to be. And for us, since they came, you can ask any of them, we didn't obstruct their work, we didn't tell them anything. In fact, at some point, they wanted to obstruct us by telling us to leave. And I was very open to them that we are not moving an inch. There's a public office, there's an office that was uh, built by taxpayers' money. And if we do not have the, ta the, the right to kick anybody out of this office, who are they to kick us out of our own office? And that has been our stance, and we were there on, until they broke the door. And they, and, and they went there. For our democracy, Esa, what's your comment on just seeing that? It's unfortunate. <laughs> just like I said, um, uh, this, this is once again a manifestation of um, the continuous um, partisan political bickering, um, uh, you know, mainly between, of course, the NPP and the UDP. I, I just see it as that. Because the reason why all these things are happening, I said this is politically motivated, it's politically charged. And like you rightly said, um, it's because he's from a political party, you know, um, that of course the executive or the president is not, you know, comfortable with. <coughs> and that's why all these things are happening. But it's, it's a manifestation yet again of the incompetence of the borough government um, to address the plight of the people. I cannot just understand looking at the, the situation that we are in as a country when we have... Um, 53% of our population into abject poverty, when we have rampant corruption in the country, high cost of living, um, almost everybody turned to be a beggar in this country. Um, the government is not engaging anything meaningful except, um, you know, force, f continuous political bickering, fighting with local, local government authorities, fighting with councils just because you want to install an individual. It's really a shame. It's really a shame and also a manifestation of um, a possible backsliding into dictatorship if we are not cautious, just like the Lord Mayor said. I did not, I did not see that um, right, but um, when you said that, I was like, okay, if that is coming from him, yeah. then this must be serious because if that comes from somebody like um, Kemo or myself or somebody else, we can say, okay, we expect that. Yeah. But if it is coming from um, the mayor himself, then that shows that this is a very serious matter. I think there are ways that the government could deal with this action, this issue. But like I said, this shows once again <coughs> that we have an incompetent leadership in this country, an incompetent government headed by somebody who is incompetent, who does not have what it takes to change the trajectory of this country. What, 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 where were you when this was happening this morning? I was in my office drinking coffee. You were not bothered? No, because I knew it was going to happen. To those who said, why didn't you allow him to come back to work all these months when she was sitting home? What's your response? It's, that's the decision of the government. That's not my decision. When we have allegations, we have had several allegations in KMC. Mm. And we have uh, dismissed, I believe, up to 20 staff on proven corruption. And the process has been exactly the same. When somebody is alleged to have been corrupt, you send them on administrative leave while investigations are ongoing. I think this is normal practice. Yeah. This is not an issue of a disciplinary matter. It's not an issue of the service commission. It's just an administrative issue and it's common sense. For all we care, it could have been solved in one day. Meaning the commission was willing to receive a letter on day one, investigate the matter, and conclude on the findings. It could have taken one day. But their inability or their refusal to investigate is what has taken two years. With all of these things happening, are you, let's say, discouraged? No, never. Are you worried? Are you going to be seen as somebody who's going, okay, such and then go by them. Lima go through the yep, Bukumoko. You know, people say, Tali. No, I mean, for me, it's just another day at work. I wake up, I do development, they fight, I defend, 
I go back, eat, have a good day with for my family. For how long can you continue defending? I can do it forever. Hmm. Because public office is not easy, but life is not easy. Every, every, every office comes with its challenges. I mean, I've worked in many institutions. Uh, there was one institution, there was such, such an issue. And we were on like this for years. So it's, it's normal, I would say, in institutions to have challenges. Yeah. However, in public administration, this is quite abnormal. Um, because it was a very simple issue that has been made complicated, as you rightly said, by politics. Uh, they could have investigated day one and said, this is right or this is wrong. But the, but the, but the government inspectors themselves made recommendations. They made recommendations. Yes, and and all the findings of the council are true and valid. Yes, and they even made recommendations as to how to go about in this issue. So that is what is not implemented, and this is why it's been going on for two years. Now, let me make this straight. Yeah. Um, what has happened today is unprecedented, and I think a new line has been crossed. And I dare, dare say it was a coup attempt on KMC. When there's an illegitimate seizure of power or authority, it's a coup d'etat. Today I saw the government effectively try to seize power from KMC, forcefully break into public office to install an individual, and forcefully try to transfer authority to that individual. So the council in many ways, they were attempting to dissolve. Now, if the government was operating by law, all they needed was a judgment or a court order. If the commission felt that we were not complying, they could have taken us to court. You do not need an executive director to infiltrate a council that already has an authority. And as we speak, they have armed police officers sleeping right now in the council chambers and an armed officer escorting the individuals. So when I say dictatorship, because this is how it starts, and when citizens watch and don't push back and don't tell the government that they are crossing lines or they're exceeding their limits and not following due process and law, it will keep happening. They will keep pushing the boundary, boundary and then one day we all wake up we are in an autocratic regime. One day they will wake up and don't even realize they've become... Why do we have armed officers right now at KMC? I have no clue. Because the lady has been there on several occasions, unobstructed, in the last three, four months. When she was coming this time, she claimed that she would be obstructed. She was not going to be obstructed. The council said, it's not an individual issue, it's not personal. She's like a sister to me. That's like that's like something a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. When this whole thing started, before it started, we were in excellent terms. Relations, yeah. But it was just something I could not forgive or brush mm. under the carpet. It was something I would have loved to have solved in a private way, in a way of sutra and, and so that we don't damage our reputation. But the ministry was not interested in that. They wanted to fight. And they saw a weapon in her and today they want their weapon in council well charged but, but so the point is we don't want to make the council about this issue council is so that's why i took out that audio i wanted the, to come to that audio yeah but before you when, get to that audio mm -hmm. before you get to that audio i think lord may it would have been terrible if you had dealt with this in another way to sutura not to you know damage her reputation or whatever because this is a, a allegation of corrupt corrupt practice so there was no way to deal with this except to do what is right i understand the ministry this could have been solved in another way <coughs> that um it wouldn't have um got to the stage where you know everybody will be like okay this this shameful act would have been done but i think at some yeah. point there was no better way to deal with this than to you know institute an investigation against her okay if i'm one thing all that we need right now is for the right thing to be done if she is found guilty 
of corrupt practice. I mean, I mean, there, is, there shouldn't be an exception for anybody. I understand the point they're trying, they're trying to make. It wouldn't have got to this stage. It wouldn't have attracted this um, public attention or public outcry to this shameful act that today we are witnessing or we have witnessed. But I think the only way to deal with this case is to make sure that the right thing is done. When she was she was found, you know, guilty um, by an investigation. Um, she's not just having dealt with according to law, and the government or the central government shouldn't have, um, you know, look for ways of trying to, like you said, use her as a weapon because that is what I'm seeing. Like, um, especially in the wake of this commission that is coming up, probably she will be the, she will be, they will use her um, against, um, you know, whoever is in the council, especially him. So I, I think really the government, like I said earlier on, um, you know, has really, really, like you said cross the lines, and this is a very bad manifestation as far as our, our democracy is concerned. I, on Monday when I, when I saw the government press release, I was like, okay, I called my camera crew, I'm like, be on standby because we are going to get news. Because uh, I was not expecting um, KMC to let her in. And then um, your audio came in, um, and I, I listened to that audio several times. And you called for calm. You didn't want anybody to destroy the work that you were of doing. Course. Why did you bring such audio? Now, meanwhile, a lot of people said that was leadership because people were scared if there was anything that happened in KMC, it could have been bad because the political tension is already very bad. Uh, there were people on WhatsApp groups who were preparing to come to KMC to fight. Why did you bring that audio out at that moment? Thank you for First, I'd like to go back a bit on ESA. Yeah. When I said um, Sutra, ESA, what I mean is, this is, it was not a public matter at the time. Yeah. It was supposed to be something that was investigated and, and done well. I haven't given opportunity for her to resign. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to what has gone down, as far as the ministry is concerned, with that letter or that memo, mm -hmm. as soon as I saw it, I almost... Because it's the same letter that was written two years ago. It was almost like a photocopy. When the PIU first stormed the KMC yeah. gates. Yeah. And it was totally uncalled for. I'm very disappointed. Because there was no indication from KMC that she would be obstructed on arrival. And in fact, I had just finished talking to them in the back channels that indeed she would be accepted in and be offered a conference room. And they were happy with that. Government. Yes. So a little after we finished talking, two hours later we see this memo. I think it was a bit of uh, beating the one's chest and trying to showcase that they are the ones in power, but with a tint of autocracy, dictatorship. There is no language. That language has no place from a public official or government. If somebody breaks the law, you just have to take them and charge them accordingly. But to release those sort of inflammatory comments is almost promoting civil unrest. And that's exactly what would have happened if I did not take out that audio. I am not one to take out audios. Nobody ever hears my audios. Yeah. Unless it's a tobaski sometimes and I send it to forums or my audios are very far and wide in between and always on positive issues. Never on problems you'll be surprised i went to the bank <laughs> i went to the bank at echo bank i think um, yeah. this was the very day she was supposed to come and i overheard two people one of them banker in fact imagine was like talib zawaru don't again audio book no you can never do gain a day and the streets would have been yep. and i was like so seriously this issue has gotten to this level yes yep. yes it so has. it has reached boiling point and the tensions are so high and all engineered by the government by the way Tensions are so high and opinions are split. It's almost now everybody has to choose a side. Yes. And this is the poison I hate that they are promoting in our society. You see, political expediency is very dangerous. For one to get what they want today politically, they can destroy our society. And that destruction is permanent. And I hate it because my politics is a politics of unifying. So I felt the need to take out that audio, or I believe 
we would have had a, a calamity at council. And I believe that is exactly what they wanted. I don't think it's by chance. Why do you think they would want that? Because I think they want to find us wanting for something. Because there's nothing. For what, what is that? There's something. Maybe, Maybe ob ob obstructing her or promoting violence. I don't know. Those, a lot of people so, said the, the government is trying to dissolve council because obviously you went to court, <laughs> you stopped them from three months limit to be able yeah. to uh, have access to council. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. with violence, the president can go to the National Assembly and try to... To say that KMC is unstable stable is a disaster. KMC is not unstable. KMC is one of the most stable institutions. The only thing unstable is the relationship between KMC and the government. So, like I said, I felt the need to take out that audio and thank God it was the right call and that audio came out because I did not even know the impact till the next day. It was on every radio, every social media outlet and it was repeated for days. Yeah. It meant good and upstanding citizens wanted and needed that audio. I received several calls from Imams, al Carlos, religious, a lot of religious leaders that you did the right thing. So I think it is our responsibility and especially government to maintain the peace and harmony within our communities. The issue is an administrative issue, and I hate that it's dominating the headlines about KMC, because KMC is much more, and much more dynamic. But it was all done and dusted for some time. For some time. Just coming back now. Elections. Oh. So this is all about elections. If elections was not three months away, you will not hear all this noise. It's all about elections to arm their soldiers with narratives and things to say to discourage voters. But we are confident enough with our track record. But I hate it because it's dividing opinions, it's forcing people to take sides, and it's making people angry for no reason. But, like I said, I had a meeting with several staff today. Everybody was wondering why I was so calm. I walked right past the offices. I went to my Galga meeting. I went to a cultural show today at Charles Jow. I want to show them this is a trivial issue. And it is a trivial issue. It's just an administrative issue. And we'll get over it. It's only sad that certain lines that should have never been crossed are crossed. But I think it's a lesson for the citizenry that we must protect our democracy at all costs. And you just because called we it the we cannot slide back to what we came from. You called it a curator. It, it is an attempted attempt. 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 It is. It is. By all means. If you force your way into an institution, choose an office for a staff that should be reporting to that institution. Break the door of that office. They were even going as far as instructing our procurement manager to use taxpayers' money to buy furniture for that office. They are calling staff and conditioning them that they must hand over power. They must uh, hand over bank accounts. If that is not a coup d'etat, I don't, I don't know what, what is. How do, you, how, how do you plan to deal with this? We will deal with it. But people want to know. I cannot divulge because I haven't met my council members. But I assure you, by next week, we'll be hearing just calm news about KMC yeah, in the audio, and our development project. In the audio to you made mention that uh, you were to meet on the 22nd of february yes Thanks. on wednesday and then you get back to her. and they're all aware that's what you we get back to her we haven't we we met on wednesday yeah when the, the was first the, when the first was on yeah and we have a meeting on friday to finalize with resolutions the government was aware that this meeting was to be held i think one thing they do they want to refuse to believe is that talib ben suda is not kmc and the mayor is not KMC. People like to pit people against each other. They want to see a Taliban sort of versus. And that's the narratives they're actually selling to the head of state. But this is not an issue of me as an individual. This is a body, an elected body, that is the only body mandated to make decisions about all matters of counsel. I am a chairperson who deliberates and heads proceedings. But I'm not the person who is having to make these decisions. It's somebody. Now, let's talk about the commission of inquiry. Yeah. The government is uh, setting up a commission to look into the affairs of all councils. Absolutely. Um, three months into election. Now, yeah. my opinion, Esa, is this. COVID-19 funds, the audit, the audit report did expose COVID-19 funds. The audit report just a few days ago exposed the security report issues. The audit report 
talked about the state house rehabilitation project. The Banju rehabilitation project, which I remembered when we broke on Kirfatu, was like crazy. Almost two billion dollars in taxpayer money. Still, we cannot feel um, the impact of it in Banjo. Um, the AKI issue uh, went to the National Assembly. We saw National Assembly members saying <coughs> that we should apologize to the Ministry no, of it's, it's, Health. It's, it's the Deputy Speaker. Don't say National Assembly. Just say the Deputy it's, Speaker. Well, I just want to, I don't want to name names. No, no, no. He, 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 no yes, yes, so I'm saying that. Deputy Speaker. With so many other audit reports that are right now being tabled, the Auditor General said government is not complying with uh, financial regulations that are happening. He called out corruption in all departments, most 99% of departments in government, even a state house. Now, a lot of people, including myself, the reason why, look, we want consul, um, consuls to be audited. I think that's what every Gambian want. Uh, we want the, uh, the anti-corruption bill to be passed. But what people are saying is this, in as much as we want this, we want the government to start home first. Charity, begins, Charity home. begins at home. That's the right word. But again, if you don't do that and start with councils three months before they go to elections, why do you expect anybody will believe that that is not uh, there's not an issue with that? Before we bring come to KMC, uh, the chair, mayor, what is your opinion about this commission? Thank you. I mean, I think um, since the <coughs> Um, announcement that the uh, commission will be set up, um, there have been divided opinions. Well, to some, it's, um, it's not necessary. Nobody challenged the legality. To some, well, it's legal, it's constitutional. And I saw, I must say this, I must say this, I saw that irresponsible statement um, from the Ministry of Justice, um, in which they cited the Constitution, I think Section 200 or whatever, that the President has powers to set up a commission. Nobody has an issue with that. Like I've always said, um, you see, not everything that is constitutional has to be done. Sometimes you look at the necessity, you look at the need. Just like when the so-called coup was coup plot was announced, you know, we have the high court, so we have the court martial. The government went on to set up an in joint investigative panel, and all of a sudden, these people were charged before the court of law. Um, and then you ask yourself, why the need to set up that investigative panel? I don't know. And then this commission too, like I'm saying, like um, not everything that is constitutional really has to be done. You have to look <coughs> at the necessity, the need. The smear fact that the government at this stage, six years getting into seven years of the Barrow administration, is still setting up commissions to look into corruption allegations is a manifestation of a failure on the part of the Barrow leadership to bring into law anti-corruption bill. It's a big failure, and, and most of the people are not even looking at it from that angle. If we had had maybe the anti-corruption law, I mean, the constitution is there, you know, like you said, the fraud squad, the police is there. Why would we need endless commissions in this country? And I've said this government has become, has made the Gambia the home of endless commissions of inquiries. Commissions of inquiries many a times that are not bringing anything positive to the people. When the, the reports are out, you know, sometimes people wonder whether really it is necessary to set up these commissions. Whether politically motivated or not, <laughs> that's a debate out there, but I've said this repeatedly, and it's my position, that if, no, if we are honest to ourselves and not being hypocrites, this is politically motivated, politically charged, hands down. Nobody should doubt that if you are an honest Gambia, you're honest to yourself and honest to this country. Now, like you, repeat, you, like you said, you have the office of the president. It's not clean. The National Audit Office report is out. It says secret report contract, how it was negotiated, dubiously negotiated at the office of the president. Banyul project office. started even before it went yeah, to the yeah, National Banyul Assembly. Banyul project was um, signed. 18 months later, it was gazetted. 18 months later. Okay? We're talking about COVID-19 funds. In Senegal, neighboring Senegal, we saw what they did about those COVID-19 funds. But even when the Minister of Health came to the National no, that's Assembly what I'm saying. and, and, and said, my people are corrupt. And admitted to corruption, this government is silent. And that is why, that is why I called that statement or press release from the Minister of Justice. In fact, it was so unprofessional. The heading of that press release, which says that um, Minister of Justice explains 
the setting up of the commission and the content of that press release are quite completely different yeah. because the content was more about a response to Dabo. They could have easily said a response to Usainu Dabo. Okay? Now, in the letter, in the letter, they said, or in the statement, they said Dabo does not have the moral authority to question the setting up of a commission because he himself has been subject <coughs> of coming sort of inquiry. Fine. If Dabo does not have the moral authority to do that, fine. But President Barrow does not also have the moral license or moral authority to set up a commission of inquiry to look into corruption allegation. Why? Because President Barrow himself is corrupt as child. His office is corrupt as child. The National Audit Office report is out there, revealing everything about how the office of the president is dubiously involved in our negotiating that contract when the Ministry of Justice itself advised the government about going into that contract. And that is why I said, if Dauda Jala as Minister of Justice is a man of principles, if he has principles, if he doesn't have principles, I have no problem. But if really he has principles, he should have resigned. Because his position is not tenable. You cannot be the legal advisor to the government, the principal legal advisor to the government. Advise the government on legal matters and they disregard it, yet you continue. You're not a man of principle. So what is happening is, it's a very unfortunate. Like I said, the president has turned this country into endless commissions of inquiries, engaged in continuous partisan political bickering, petty squabbles with the UDP. Gambia is bigger than UDP. Gambia is bigger than NPP. Yeah. Gambia is bigger than President Barrow. Gambia is bigger than Usainu Dabo. Gambia is bigger than Talib Ben Sura. We cannot, this country is at a standstill because of the endless fight between UDP and PP. Mostly, mostly, if we have to be honest with ourselves, That's true. triggered by the influence. What's the independent union officer? So, what I'm saying you is independent that, independent people in we, also, like you said, we have rampant corruption in this country. Uh -huh. Poverty in this country. Hunger. 53% of the population are into poverty. Transparency International is reporting that we are 110 out of 180 countries in terms of corruption. As small as we are, we are only better than 80 countries. We are saying that 44 billion it's coming from remittance. It shows that there's no productivity, as he hinted to. He hinted. There's no productivity in this country. You go to banks and supermarkets, everybody has become a beggar in this country. Either directly or indirectly, everybody has become a beggar. If you tell me, like, maybe how many people come to your house? How many people come to your office? How many people approach him in his office? Everybody has become a, become a beggar in this country. The government... It's not bothered by some of these things. These pressing issues that Gambians are faced with. Constantly the government is engaged in taking excuse. COVID-19, Ukraine war. COVID-19, Ukraine war. It seems that you are unfit to manage the affairs of this country. In the sense that governments must have solutions to problems. Problems will exist in society. Even peace cannot be perpetual. Problems, conflicts will happen. After the Ukraine-Russia crisis, we are expecting another one. Let's tighten our belts. Another one will come. That's how complex the world has become. After COVID-19, let's expect another pandemic probably. So problems must exist. As a government, a responsible government, a responsive government, you must come up with solutions. But this government shows no care, no interest in addressing the challenges that we face as a country. In taking care of the welfare and well-being of the Gambian people. All that the government is engaged in is partisan political fight. How best, and I said, this is an attempt to kind of control grassroots politics in this country. And if the president, if the incumbent should succeed in that, let's forget about the fight or the corruption issue that he's having with them. But let's look at it from the, our democracy point of view. If the president will succeed in controlling grassroots politics in this country, councillors and local, I mean, and mayors and chairpersons, then our democracy, we are doomed as a country. That is a threat. That is a sign that we will be sliding into dictatorship. So at this point in time, it is a shame that the borough government <coughs> cannot pinpoint or point at anything tangible that they have achieved for this country from 2017 up to date anything tangible they cannot point at anything tangible that they have achieved for us all that we are engaged in is setting up commissions like i said there should have been if you're really serious with fighting corruption there should have been commissions set up 
to look into your own office because your own office is dirty it's not clean thank That's you his own office. thank you Esa. now uh, mayor the president is within his powers to set up commissions i i i, I believe that and I, these these are constitutional powers that he has and i think every gambian recognizes that and i think for me and other people is the timing that that has issues but we're also saying um, if you are not scared of going to the commission would they follow the rakai Commission. Uh, commission. Okay. So basically, I think um, I would like to comment Esa. Mm -hmm. I think he said it very well. I couldn't say it like he said it. Mm -hmm. But it's a case of the pot calling the kettle black. Mm -hmm. um, but not only that, we are not scared to go to any commission. Yeah. Like I said, I, I know as one of the local government leaders, I have been one of the most scrutinized. Like I said, we've been investigated by OP. We've been uh, inspected by special inspection by the ministry. We go under a lot of scrutiny, FPAC, Local Government Select Committee, GVPA, National Audit Office. So scrutiny is part of our lives. And we go through a lot of public scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So KMC is one of the institutions where leakages happen on a daily basis. Any letter in KMC, there's nothing private in KMC. And so, so it should be. Yeah. It's a public office. office. Uh, anybody has access to all information. And it's not us, the policymakers, making transactions. That is happening at the administrative level, which we don't have control over. Checks are signed by the CEO or director of finance. So commission is not an issue for us. I don't think there's any chairman or mayor sweating about a commission. Mm -hmm. What we know is it is meant to reduce our chances in election, to keep us busy trying to uh, uh, clear up misinformation, to keep us bu busy trying to attend commission deliberations instead of campaigning, is to keep us distracted. Like, just look at what, what's been happening last two weeks in KMC. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of campaign events I couldn't go to. There's a lot of uh, things I couldn't attend to because we are trying to uh, figure out what's happening at the council. So, effectively, what he's trying to say is if there was a routine uh, 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 investigation with corruption, so there was a routine way in which government was dealing with reported fraud or corruption, and then it came to councils, nobody would query. I think the fact that it's not happen, been happening, and then all of a sudden, two months before our election, after we win a Supreme Court case, all of a sudden there's one. We don't only think that it's a retaliation because of us winning the Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. We also think that it's politically motivated because elections are just around the corner. And I said it in one of my, uh, in my audio, I yeah. said, if the incumbent uh, is sure that he would win and he would replace us through the ballot, why not just wait and replace us through the, the, through the ballot? Why all of, all of this and throwing the population into uh, uh, chaos? And like he said, I think this is one of the things um, that has polarized the country. It is further dividing uh, people. Yeah. And it's all based on what? Misinformation. Because if there was anything tangible by the government, I think they should just take it to the AG's chambers to prosecute. Yeah. People who are found wanting. The purpose and the strategy behind a commission on their part is to create a soap opera, an audience. Once somebody comes and sits in front of a commission, commission. I do hear their stories. Yeah. We just want me to come and sit in front of the commission. Just that, we'll be happy. Because it creates doubt yeah. in the minds of many. Oh, why is he being commissioned? Yeah. Is it because he did something? So at the end of it, when nothing is found and nothing will be found, elections is passed. So that is, that is the point of all of this. Because if there's already evidence, what's the purpose of a commission of inquiry? If witnesses are already around, documentation is already in the office, what can a commission generate that an investigation cannot? So, like I said, it is, uh, 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 of course, a strategy on their part. And as Esa said, we are coming to a point where the president's party is becoming more powerful than Gambia government. It's becoming more influential than Gambia government. Because when the commission issue came up, mm -hmm. it was not the government that came out to respond. To announce even. It was cabinet ministers wearing political party hats at a political bureau defending why a commission should happen and lambasting their political opponents. When that 
uh, sort of uh, uh, those ministers should have been the ones at cabinet level wearing no political colors announcing this. Secondly, I found something very strange in the Independence Day, where as part of the parade, the yeah. president's party was openly promoting their candidates. I saw that. I, I think that on a day of national independence. Is it for Kim or Banjo? Banjo. So we're coming to a dangerous space, like he said, where everything is about politics. Sometimes I see a member of the uh, a different party, like the MPP, visit my office, and they're even scared and uncomfortable and, and as if they just entered a foreign country. And I always tell them, say, hey, you know, I don't want to be seen here in your office. I'm like, why? You're a Gambian. Why don't you want to be seen in my office? So it's to a point where now everybody's looking at everybody with political lens. Oh, he's yellow. I won't talk to him. He's gray. Oh, he's not part of me. Don't trust this. And then it is damaging the social fabric of our society, society, where everything is about politics. Politics has become even more poisonous than tribe. Yeah. Family members are not talking. They are not visiting each other. People are losing trust in each other. And the role of the president or the mayor, in when you look at the local government act, the number one role of the mayor is to maintain peace and harmony in the community. And we should be the unifiers. We should be the ones to make people understand that their nationality comes first. But the way in which they are running this country, the way in which they are running the politics, it will cause irreparable damage. And like he said, commissions are here to stay. Yeah. But governments will go. Yes. But the commissions are here to stay. stay. Because it has become, it was weaponized by the former regime and is being weaponized by this regime, and it will be a tool of future regimes, and it's not about substance. Because even when you look at this commission, I think it's the first somebody told me, without a preamble. There's no report to form the basis of the commission. So to keep it short, it's not that we are challenging the president's right because it's in law. It's not that we don't want to attend or we don't think we should be coming up because we think we should be. We are a public institution. But it is the nature, the timing, etc. But like I said, it would just be a TV show. Are you worried that um, a lot of people, I'm just going to be honest, and you know, Barodal, Daflin, Buga, eliminate. This is commission, we will Baro Motana Commissioner, Moitana Lead Council, Motana Nip. So the report began, you know, we found on um, um, the commission, see how you have no for them. Understand? Commission be recommended, uh, I think they should serve, not serve in public office. That is for the rest of your life. For if Mayor Ben Suda, Rohim Ali Glo, or Landing, these are the future leaders of the UDP. And among these people, we expect <coughs> presidential candidates and party leaders. If all of you are banned, that means UDP don't have... <laughs> we, we're going to be starting looking for other people. Is that what you are worried? Are you worried about that? I'm it, not worried about that. Why? I hear the rumors. I hear it from inside their camp. I hear it from outside their camp. I hear the rumors. As far as we have laws, and as far as we have courts, and the courts are not compromised, I don't think that can stand. Secondly, I don't think there's such a law that can ban you from public office for life. I think there's one for parliament and there's one for presidency, but as far as local government is concerned, I don't think. But anything that a commission brings up can be appealed. So also, I trust that my colleagues, as I have, have not been running rogue councils and individual, individualizing decision making or monopolizing decision making. Every council, like I said, makes executive decisions as a body. And they're immune in law for making those decisions. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Hmm. They have immunity as far as the decisions were made oh. at the council deliberation. You cannot blame a body for voting on what they think is right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. They will try. Like he said, we have no whims about what this commission is about. We have no doubts what their target is and what they're looking for. And who they're targeting. And, and who they're targeting. Okay. Uh, but like we said, 
we will enter it as God-fearing Gambians in good faith, and then we see how it goes. But we must call them out for what it for is. What it is. What, one thing that I also want to say is, um, when I look at everything, when the press release that they have regarding the commission, um, they said one thing they're also going to investigate, I think, has to do with the salary increment. Um, how you're able to increase salaries. <laughs> Funny, funny but government enough. increased salary. That's what I'm saying. The president's yeah. salary has been increased. Now we're paying him three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> He's not bothered to investigate how his salary was increased. And does he even disagree? But that went to the national assembly. No, no, no. But that's what I'm saying. It was approved yeah. by the assembly. No, but that's what I'm saying. You see, the process of getting it, giving getting to national assembly, mm -hmm. you know, for it to be approved and all that, it's not only him. Even the parliamentarians, the speaker and the deputy speaker's salary have been increased. You have a council that should have that degree of autonomy, okay? I'm not sure how they this how you decide your salaries. Whether you are, I think you said you don't have a salary structure, or whatever you don't have control over that. They have it at the central government. Yes, but, but, but my the, point is, what is wrong with having? I mean, the councils having their salary structured, you know, having an increment at their own level because there has been thirty percent increment before that. There was fifty percent increment. There was there has been thirty percent increment. Why? interested in investigating how they increase their salary so my whole point i mean the, the point here is that this government the issues that they want to investigate in these councils these are issues that are also pre, um, i mean um, um, present in the central government that they can deal with but those are things that they will not they will never look at so for me like like i like i said um it's just another uh, manifestation of how incompetent this government is um, how unfit the leadership is um, to manage the affairs of this country without um, going into you know petty political squabbles with the opponents. So I think what what has happened, like you rightly said, it's an issue of they are targeting people. They have insiders in council who will tell them, put this on your tiara, put that on your tiara, put that on your tiara, and a lot of these people who are giving them information sometimes are not well informed and they don't have the administrative work. It's just gossip. They hear rumors that they don't fully understand and they will tell them, put it on your paperwork to investigate. That's why I'm saying the Commission of Inquiry needs a preamble, a report of substance. And they also say whether you and, have a strategic plan. And, and so that. it might end up being a farce. <laughs> Because it's not based on findings or a report. You understand what I'm saying? So what is happening, like you said, these issues are all happening at the central government. Central government, in my time in office, has increased salaries twice, 50% and 30%. And we've been asked by our online ministry to implement. So I know somebody has told them, oh, councils are paying themselves more than is prescribed in the Finance and Audit Act. The Finance and Audit Act 2002 or nine, uh, 2002 years says, for example, mayor of KMC should be paid seven thousand dollars. But when I came to office, I found the salary at about forty thousand, which was what the former mayor was receiving. That's what I found in office, and it has not been changed until unless government says this increase and that increase. You understand what I'm saying, but. People, their agents in council will tell them, oh, we heard this, we heard that, so put it on the TOR. And this is why the basis of forming this commission is weak. And it's more of a, what do you call it, a, a sort of soap opera, opera yeah. where you just want people to sit and then you accuse them of stuff, spread misinformation. So the people at the grassroots level who are not very educated will be debating and be in doubt and be confused and then you use that opportunity to strike. As a but, but even, but with, how even with that, <laughs> even with that saying what is you know <clears throat> prescribed and what they are receiving, if there is discrepancy, but it's again we come back to the to the president himself, the media people talk. National Assembly will approve this, and the president will go and spend more than that. So let him start holding himself to account as far as spending public money is concerned. So I mean, any, anywhere they point at, you see fault. On their side so i think they should they, they like you said charity begins at home yeah let us start from their own house put their house in order it's already mess 
the palo is not clean they be living i mean nothing is clean there so i think they should put their house in order first before getting to the country. i just want to say something i think kmc should be credited when we came into office we found a lot of ghost workers mm -hmm. people paid salaries who were not really working at kmc we did not find any scheme of service no hr manual so we had to clean up all of this where we had to remove all those ghost workers had to come up with a service scheme you know had to come up with hr uh, policies and like i said we are the only institution who has been aggressively fighting uh, corruption i may, I, then, I, I should not say only but one of the, the institutions that has been fighting it and like i said we have gotten rid of several staff with the same process for stealing or embezzling taxpayers funds but there was not, never an issue until this one and in my time there has been many people don't know but four ceos oh, really? the one that was in council was moved or sorry was terminated by the interim management that was led by bakari jamme before my arrival mm -hmm. the one i met there was let go of because of conduct the one who came after that was not uh, i recommended but was not taken by the uh, uh, ministry and then they brought the the current ceo one. the current the current one so the movement of staff is a natural thing based on their track record and based on the case in hand so why this one is so impeccably uh, interesting i don't understand but like i said at the end of the day is politics and we realized that all the terminations or all the movements we were doing when the npp did not exist was very smooth when the udp and the current government were the same was very smooth there was no squabble but as soon as this political split happened that's when matters became extremely complicated and it was not about process it was not about law it was just about politics ah, now finally mayor uh glory mm. wahwa kmc commission the uh government set up ninko gisne lu hew tay kmc ah lan nga bugo wax askani kmc ñi nga xamne ñu ngi setan ah commission bi dina am right now as we speak gisna the president dina mu ngi inaugurate commission member si elec dina ko inaugurate kon dafa melni commission bi dina am way sa askan bi wa kmc lan nga len bugo wax si xew xew bi ñep mi nga xamne mo nek di xew right now ah ma ngi nuyu askan bi di len sandra di len gërem di len wane lu xew kmc mom is unfortunate ak ci dëkk bi yépp with the local government councils ah du luñu bugga gis ci dëkk bu nga xamne ñi ngay jëma def nit ñi ñu nekk bëna won dañu xamne rek ah politics la time politics mo ñew ñi ngay duggu election so ciow bi mom fok mu am lolu mom ci politique la bokka won da it is the responsibility pour kilifa gohi borom kër yi ak nit ñi KMC ñu ensoné waxi politician duggu sen gohi kasaré nit ñi ini joté ini wax bu sew def be bu nga xamné nit ñi duñu mëna dikat ci jaama ñu xamné tam politician bu ñëw sa kër o sa koñ o sa community pour campaign bu mu bay sa kër sa koñ ku fekalé ñi ngeen nekka bëna mu gëna fofu ngeen jopp ngeen jappo kon nañ bay suñu xel né politique dafa dem dafa ñëw politician tam dafa dem dafa ñëw political parties dañu dem dañu ñëw on de suñu dëkk bi mom dafa dess ba pare dëkk bi rek lañ am ba pare lu gëna important ci dëkk moy sisin sib moy ñun ñep doomi rew lañ ñun ñep gambian lañ regardless of suñu het suñu diina suñu political party kon ma ngi wax gaay né KMC mom dara lu bon du fa xew inshallah as far as man fa ba pare liggéey bi na continuer so wi yaakar na né one week la rek won de inshallah nañ continuer ñu ensoné liggéey nit ñi def nañ ko priority because lu rek mo tax ñu nek fofu kon ñu ngi leen di santa di leen gërem di leen wax jëri jëf ñom tamit pour seen taxaway ci council now i don't have a final message i Do you want to say anything to President Baro? No, I've said what. Kopo gabi nene me. Dafa melni dal yo mom controversie rek mo la fi de indi. 
Why not next time? No more than you. Seka, after election, see. Why didn't you ask about election? We will have you to do the campaign season. You will see programs, see. Learn more plans. We go interview more. Good and good about him. But we'll talk about the plans when the political season. We'll get all the all the political. Why did you not? I'm going to be in Yemen. You know that. I'll just know you have bad. I'll just know you're in a row. I'm going to president time. Presidential election. I mean, there's no back door. We'll have them back door. How are you? Under your car, man. I'm going to go back door. Yeah. 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 Put him on arm. I think sometimes we forget about all of these, the things that we went through to be where we are today. So it's important for new swing democracy. We want to progress. You have divergent views. They ngeneka mayo bena bena karu elenga difa at mom because mom ni wat ni elek bugay ne mane na mane na so gay mo hene yo opposition nga mane na nyina mayo yu usenu dabo mane na bismu usenu dabo deme pale kero ngena hamne mandu mo usenu dabo because if he is the one holding taxpayers money we will ask about it when he was vice president for na interview buin ko musa interview be pa bi mer swing kausa because he was vice president we are going to ask the tough questions so when you are in public office and people come after you and ask for questions about how you're managing our funds i think you should understand that that has nothing to do or being uh, different uh, political parties but it's more about holding government officials accountable and lolu buñ ko ñaké ci réew mi rek démocratie du gana té lolu yaakar na né ben gam yandu ko nangum commission bi nak dina dor gis na né président wax nañu légui uh, president dina inaugurate uh, commissioners tomorrow uh, inshallah dina leen ni report bi why nak uh, commission proceedings tam dinañ ko baye help how man nak yeen nak sen campaign bi nakala mo mel ak sen campaign bi ndat dina leen distract ak yeno no but i'm sure you guys will figure out that with the commissioners but until we come your way again uh, next week thursday and we will follow developments at KMC and the commission good night to you all Allah. see you next week bye bye Yiruwa men kafutan na tarambulo luto nga GIA Kago Complex Parendile puruka julaya sone yandi. Kadungo ni mfunti bunda na dokuo sembentu ya Banjul International Airport oto. Mensi nyafa si moluma melika fengolu ki bantala banko lukang anin julandingo lufana. Faisi sula na kago doko la lebang. Katu, masingo lube mbulule ikafume ye forklifts. Melika selendiro ni njindiro ke baka solula melbe funti kangu waranto kaduna na warehouse olukono. Nga dinkira sumayari ngo lufana sotole ifula mila fano mu metari kemeleti. Karo bela adung isi kago baka solu tano Mensita for ton town war. Ila suma ya fana futata tembeleto. Menka fendolu mabono fo ikana atinya. Fosene fengolu lombang. Domori fengolu. Waranto jata kendea ni mbori ma fengolu. Kago baga solu la taradula kendo. Asulata jama ni labang korosiri lango lulela. Na double view extra korosiri la masingolu. Aka kago baga so kono kono jubele. Komi kago do kuo sartoli ya landi nyameng. Nyin double view extra. Amu jama ni labang rapid scan eleti. Menka karafula korosiro keno kago sifa bela. Wati kilingo kono. Na do kulalo. Imu ayata karandingo leti. Mili ya la doku wa noo ifara mansata kago doku wa na tamandiri nyato na doku wa la betea Wayem futan di RA3 makamoleto mensa tina fo nse kago bagaso lu kinole kata UK ani EU banko lukang GIA ka hakili tenkungo dila na doku wato ite njina la men Every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon. To make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets with a liberal air transportation policy. That daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators, and for a highly ranked tourist destination the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, 
operate and manage BIA technical requirements merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily. Thank you.